I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. Um, and uh, we also want to uh, welcome today's presenters, uh, Rebecca Bryant and Michelle Faneuil, both from OCLC Research. Um, let's see, Rebecca is going to be kicking us off today, so I will switch over to her slides and hand things over to Rebecca to get things started. Thanks, Rebecca. Take it away. Thanks, Marilee. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to kick us off and say that today's webinar is on identifying and acting on incentives when planning RDM services. Again, my name is Rebecca Bryant, and I'll be co-presenting with Michelle Faneuil today. Our previous webinar, which we held on October 2nd, and which was recorded and you can still watch, focused on the what in RDM services what services might be included in an RDM service bundle, in other words. Today we're going to focus on the complementary internal and external incentives that influence decision-making priorities and services that are offered, with a particular focus on the needs of researchers. Uh, in other words, we're going to be discussing the why. So our goal with this three-part webinar series is to offer a framework as well as a community for institutions to examine their own current and future RDM service bundles. Um, many of you are also participating in the companion interest group as well. Uh, and I can see that the learning guide um, merely is just posted to everyone in the chat box. That is intended to help support your conversations. Uh, as well as to sort of provide sort of a, a thumbnail sketch of our discussion today. So you can open that and also follow along. Um, again, just a note, if you're attending this webinar, you're probably already well familiar with OCLC research, um, a subunit of OCLC uh, supporting research and development for the library community for about 40 years now. Uh, this webinar today is focused and available exclusively for research library partner members, and we're really glad that we have a, a large transnational group of people participating. So this webinar focuses on two separate but complementary lines of research here at OCLC related to research data management. The first one along the top of your screen is the realities of research data management, which Brian Lavoie and that really focuses on the what, how, and why of institutional RDM services. Uh, and the second line of research it focuses on user and researcher behaviors, uh, particularly for social science researchers, uh, and includes activities like data sharing and reuse. Uh, this is the work led by my colleague and co-presenter, Ishelle Faneuil. So we're going to be covering both of these things today. I'm going to kick off by reintroducing you to the report series. Today we're really focusing on the content from the third report uh, and talking about incentives. And again, Brian and I, along with our colleague Constance Maupas, were the project team developing these reports and doing this research. It's a qualitative case study of four institutions in four different national environments. So in the United States, that's the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, in the UK, the University of Edinburgh, in the Netherlands, Wageningen University and Research, and then in Australia, Monash University. We looked at these four case studies and examined their processes as well as their decision making uh, uh, and, and, and how they decided to act and then what they decided to do. And also as a reminder, in the first two reports, and then also previously in our October 2nd webinar, we provided an overview of the RDM service space and particularly offered this model for understanding three components of an institution's service bundle. Uh, the first is education. The second on the right is expertise, that sort of support for customized solutions and, and supporting expert advice for researchers. 
And the third is curation. That includes the technical infrastructure, but also other services that support the research data lifecycle. Um, we focused on this in the October 2nd webinar, but I will be referring back to it uh, occasionally through the rest of my talk here. So the key point that Brian and I talked about in this third report related to incentives is going to be the rest of what I talk about in my time here. Uh, and we really focused on four incentives for why institutions acquire RDM capacity or why they develop RDM services. Uh, they're multifaceted, um, they often overlap, uh, but we've tried to divide them into these four areas to help simplify and facilitate thinking about these. And, and these are compliance, evolving scholarly norms, institutional strategy, and researcher demand. Uh, I'm going to talk about each of these um, and then you know, offer you some sort of things to th think about as it relates to your institution moving forward, and then we'll have a couple uh, of a specific institutional examples to sort of bring those to life. So the first piece um, relates to compliance. Um, but what we mean by compliance are data management mandates. Um, they also might be discussed as guidelines, uh, and they may come from many different sources. They may come from national agencies, from private or uh, federal funders, journals, and maybe other external stakeholders. So this is one very important driver of the four that we identify for RDM services. Um, we tend to think of these sorts of sh data sharing and retention mandates monolithically, but in fact, they're actually there's just a, a lot of um, distinctiveness from country to country and from even from funder to funder. For example, in the Netherlands, the Code of Conduct for Scientific Practice mandates that research data sets are to be preserved for a minimum of 10 years, uh, which really amplifies the importance of reliable long-term data preservation strategies. So in other words, that mandate for 10 years of preservation is helping directing Dutch activities in that way. But in the United States, you can see that one of the, the, funding, the largest funding organizations, the National Science Foundation, or the NSF, requires data management plans, or DMPs, for uh, um, anyone seeking or receiving a grant from NSF. Uh, and this has also really um, influenced U.S. institutions to respond by supporting data management plans for their researchers. And for instance, we saw this at the University of Illinois, that it, which was an institution that played an active role in developing the DMP tool following the NSF mandate. Also, we can see that DMP requirements so far are less important in Australia, and we saw uh, indeed less emphasis on this at Monash. So the second uh, type of incentive I want to talk about is evolving scholarly norms. Um, these are coming about because of the rapidly changing, evolving scholarly record, uh, and we are increasingly seeing research and technology, research that's dispersed on the network, um, and there's just rapid technology to change how research happens and how it can be shared uh, and reused. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of advocacy from open science advocates also really encouraging the rapid changing of these norms. But these, these changes are not uniform. They're different across different parts of the research community, you know, between maybe libraries and between other, you know, maybe the research office have different thoughts on this, or it may be different across different disciplines. Uh, so we really have, you know, while we see these changes, we have to acknowledge that they're not uniform. And so this is something for institutions to be thinking about is what parts of the scholarly community are you working with? Are you a large comprehensive institution working with, with researchers across many, many institutions? Or are you, um, you know, are you more focused? Maybe it's more biomedical that may um, 
and, and enable you to focus sort of in different ways. Um, one of the things that we, one of the ways we saw institutions seeking to um, respond to this was by um, establishing policies related to research data management. Uh, and this is in some ways also a response to the compliance piece because there's still a lot of uncertainty and fluidity there. Um, but most of the institutions in our study have attempted to clarify some of these things and to bring some, some sense to this by developing institutional research data management policies. And those are intended to help articulate goals, strategic directions, and specific protocols for researchers at that institution. Uh, all the all three of the institutions out of the four in our study have institutional data policies, uh, and that th those three are Monash, Edinburgh, uh, and Wageningen. The one exception is the University of Illinois, um, but Illinois um, does have a, a policy that's specific for its Illinois Data Bank data sharing and repository service. So it has also responded in a way related to that. The third type of uh, incentive I want to talk about is institutional strategy. Uh, and here we want to make a point that university investment in, in RDM infrastructure services and personnel uh, is motivated by locally relevant incentives. Um, while universities tend to share the view that RDM is important, um, the mix of incentives or motivates them um, can vary widely. So some might be responding mainly to internal interests, such as maximizing grant funding or enhancing their research reputation, or maybe even building distinctive capacities. But others could be driven by more external motivations like the policy mandates. But of course, all of these things um, play a role to some degree in university decision making about RDM. So it's, it's really, again, looking at your local situation to decide what that, that looks like. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this institutional strategy when we look at the case study from the University of Illinois. So the last point here of the four incentives that we define is researcher demand. And one of the things we found was that researcher demand or responding to researcher needs uh, may be far more important in shaping and sustaining RDM services than incentivizing their creation. Uh, for me, this has been one of the most interesting parts of our study, um, particularly because um, I've been able to work with Brian on this. Brian's trained as an economist, uh, and it's interesting to observe that you know, basic economics would tell us that um, a key motivator for developing RDM services would be an expression of need on the part of researchers. Um, in other words, university would develop them because researchers are demanding them. But we saw that these incentives played a fairly minor role in our four case studies uh, and those institutional decisions to act. They were primarily driven by the other three incentives that I detailed. Uh, instead, we see educational outreach activities to educate researchers on research data management um, working as an effort to continue to build demand. Uh, and so some institutions would say they feel like it's important to have the services available at the point that researchers start to need them, so to anticipate that. Um, I think there's also a lot more to say about this, about researchers' behaviors and needs. Um, and we're, this is the part that Michelle is actually going to follow up on about much more about their behaviors, because this is much of her research focus. But before we go on to that, I have two case studies. The first one is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign here in the United States. And I want to point out um, some different things here on the timeline. Um, an important driver at the University of Illinois was compliance. Uh, the University of Illinois in the US receives more grant funding from the National Science Foundation than any other research university uh, in the country. 
So um, when the NSF began requiring data management plans from its researchers, um, the University of Illinois took notice. Uh, and this, in fact, I think also helped to um, uh, motivate Illinois to begin working uh, as a community to develop the DMP tool. It had also informed here on the top, you can see the institutional strategy, because within a couple of years, support for the research data service, that's RDS, had been elevated to an institutional line item in the campus strategic plan. So that compliance also helped to form an institutional strategy that Illinois wanted to be seen as an institution that was demonstrating that it really was supporting its researchers related to informed data management practices for those, those researchers applying for NSF funds. Now going back down to the bottom, you can see that you know, even before uh, a staff member is hired in 2014, they began doing outreach sort of as, as a committee-based work to help um, share information about researchers, but I would also say to work to develop researcher demand in this. But also, as the service has matured, you see that the institution is responding to needs that have been expressed by the researcher and that are uncovered in our report related to the need for active data storage. In other words, resources to help support storage, sharing of data in the midst of the research life cycle before it's a, a sort of final copy for preservation and final sharing. So that's an example from Illinois. If you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box and we can get to them later. The last uh, example I also wanted to share was from Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. And so you can see here that they um, dedicated resources pretty early, 2011, to support uh, research data management. Like Illinois, in 2013, they begin um, education and research uh, and education and outreach related to workshops and et cetera to help educate faculty and students related to the need for responsible data management practices. So that's also part of this. We're ahead of the need of the researcher, but we, we want to help educate them on why they need this. And then coming a little bit later, in 2014 and then revised in 2017, the graduate school worked with um, the library to develop and announce uh, a research data management policy requiring uh, first a DMP and then also data sharing uh, for any um, dissertation completed at Wageningen. This, I think, relates to both evolving scholarly norms, the need for policy to help support um, uh, and control for some of these changes, but also an institutional strategy that it was important for Wageningen, for the graduate school in particular here, to emphasize that we want to support and we have the value that we want to train our researchers to be responsible researchers. So that's all sort of part of that story as well and how we can see some of these um, incentives expressed in this landscape. So once again, we have um, our four-part incentives. Uh, I want to turn your attention back to researcher demand because this is the moment when I turn um, the conversation over to Michelle to talk about her research related to the needs of researchers. Uh, hi, all. Hopefully everyone can hear me OK. You sound great. Perfect. So. Um, Thanks, first of all, Rebecca and Brian, for having me here. It's nice to see some familiar names in the attendee list. As Rebecca said, my name is Michelle Faniel, so I'm one of the uh, senior research scientists here. And what I thought I'd do is just start by acknowledging my key collaborators here on this first slide, uh, Beth Yakel, Eric Kansa, Sarah Witcher Kansa. Uh, together, we and the rest of our team members uh, represent various areas of expertise, interests, and roles, whether it's library and information science, archives, information systems, archaeology, uh, social science, zoology, or curation. 
and this range of expertise and interests um, among the project teams that I'm working with is necessary uh, given my research in RDM, which I've been working through for about a decade now. Uh, working within this area requires a variety of skills and perspectives, as you can imagine, not only from me and my research, but we see it in the work that Rebecca just presented on incentives, as well as the RDM work that you all are doing to support your institutions. We, need, we all need these various areas to come together and line up around an RDM program for it to be effective. And that's a theme uh, within my work that I hope you'll see as I present today. So at first glance, my research may uh, sound or seem a bit narrow. Um, I'm focusing on researchers, uh, specifically their data reuse needs. Uh, but today I'll talk about how that has unfolded and grown. And through the findings, my hope is that you'll walk away and reflect on how it um, has and can impact your work. So we started with the Dipper project, which you see on the left-hand side at Reuse. This was funded by IMLS. And here we examined the needs uh, from a data reuser's perspective, asking how they evaluate and decide to reuse data. And specifically, we were interested in what reusers needed in addition to the data. So data's context of production, what context information that they need. We were interested in why they needed it. So what kinds of decisions about data reuse they were making, what kinds of evaluations of that data. And then we were also interested in where they got it, so the sources of context that were important. And we thought if we answered these questions, our findings could then be used to inform both data deposit and curation. And at the time of this study, and this started in 2010, it was important to start at the end of the life cycle. That was important to me to purposefully interview and observe and survey data reusers because no one really knew about their needs. Not the data producers, not the curators or data managers, not librarians and not archivists. Yet the idea was to share data so that it could be reused. So the findings from the Dipper project I'm going to be discussing today will cover these three questions we posed. And it's based on 105 interviews and observations with data reusers in three disciplinary communities, quantitative social science, uh, zoology, and archaeology. So I wanted to start with the first question, right? What context about the data is needed when deciding to reuse? And we found that researchers mentioned 12 types of context they needed or they wanted when making data reuse decisions. And we were able to organize these into three broad categories. So there was information related to the data production process. Um, you can see that over on the left side here. Um, data collection uh, for zoologists and archaeologists, specimen and artifact information was important. Data producers were important, um, their data analysis, missing data and research objectives. But what was interesting is that the, the need for context went beyond the context in which the data was being produced. Information about the repository was important. And you can see that at the bottom of the screen. Provenance, reputation and history, uh, curation and digitization processes. And information about reuse was important. Um, prior reuse, terms of use when it comes to the data, as well as advice on reuse. So in this next slide, you're, you're actually seeing some of the findings in terms of the context types by discipline on this based on the percentage of researchers who mentioned each context type. Now, I'm not going to go over these findings in exhaustive detail. I'm kind of giving everyone a 50,000-foot view as I go through these different projects. So I'm going to cover the highs and the lows across discipline across the disciplines just to give you a sense of some of the similarities and differences. So for instance, we can see here the social scientists we interviewed. Now these folks were typically reusing quantitative data collected from surveys and questionnaires. Um, they mentioned data collection information the most, and you can see that with the gray bar on the top. Uh, this is followed by data producer information, uh, data analysis information, and prior reuse information. If we look at the zoologists, and hopefully it's coming through as an orange bar on your slide, um, they reuse data from specimens such as birds, fish, insects, mollusks, 
and the specimen information was mentioned the most, followed by data collection information and provenance and data producer information. And lastly, we have the archaeologist in blue who reused data from artifacts collected at excavation sites. So we can think about animal bones or coins or pottery. And they look similar to the zoologists in terms of what they mentioned, but data collection information was mentioned the most, followed by provenance and artifact information, which were mentioned about the same frequency. Data producer information, however, was mentioned a little less frequently. So that's just kind of giving an overview in terms of the different types of context information that were important across these three disciplines. Uh, in, in addressing the second question, we can, when we think about researchers making decisions about reuse, they tend to take several things into consideration, attributes about the data when they're evaluating it for reuse. And today I'm just going to talk about one in the interest of time, trust. So in this analysis you see here, we focused on things that were used as a marker or a proxy for trusting the data. Here again, the findings show the percentage of researchers who mentioned the marker by discipline. So when it comes to trusting the data, we found documentation was a common marker across the disciplines, particularly the quality of it. In other words, data reusers considered how the data were documented rather than what was documented about the data when trying to establish trust in that data. You know, did that person who, doc who created that documentation do a good job? Was it of high quality? And you can also see the data producer was a commonly accepted marker of trust in data across the three disciplines. So the identity of the data producer was important. So interesting to, to me was the way that the social scientists and the zoologists used the repository's reputation as a differentiator when establishing trust in people's data that was housed in that repository. They were able to make these differentiations between different repositories in terms of the data that they would reuse or the repositories that they would go to. Now in this slide, we can also see differences. So when it came to original peer-reviewed publications and prior reuse, Zoologists used the uh, peer-reviewed publications to cross-validate information from museums, whereas the social scientists used the prior reuse information as an indicator of acceptance of that data within the disciplinary community. So again, both of these were markers of trust in the data. So where did these reusers get these 12 types of context that I talked about earlier? We found that they um, got these uh, different types of context from seven key resources. And again, the findings represent the percentage of researchers who mentioned these sources. So if we look at archaeologists on the light blue, data producer records were the most frequently mentioned. And these records are typically records that are generated in the field at the excavation site. So you can think of photos, hand-drawn maps, data entry forms, written narratives. Less important for the archaeologists were the artifacts themselves. Instead, it was everything recorded about and around the artifact that was key when it comes to context information archaeologists needed to make reuse decisions. Now we can compare that to zoologists who relied heavily on the specimens themselves, along with repository and museum records, peer-reviewed publications, and data producer records. If we look at the social scientists, they mentioned needing most sources, right, to some degree. But code books and documentation were mentioned the most, and these terms were used interchangeably. And so these, these documents, the code books, the documentation, they held the information about the data producer's collection and analysis processes, such as survey questions or sampling methodology. They might also have descriptive statistics, missing data reports or data producer publications, maybe uh, curation notes. The interesting thing here also is the importance of people. Even though everyone, people are going to repositories for the data, they don't lose sight of the people and the importance of people for getting context. It was still critical across all the disciplines. So this is one line of research that, that we've been going down. And I'm wondering, 
um, a question for you all. Um, how have data reuse needs? And we can think about the different types of context. We can think about trust markers. We can think about sources of context information or other things that you've run across. But how have data reuse needs influenced your work to support researcher demand at the point of deposit as well as at the point of dissemination? So we've been studying reuse and we continue to study reuse, but we've also, and we've studied that as a means to inform uh, deposit and curation, but we've also broadened our examination to include a larger set of, to include a larger set of people involved in a larger part of the data life cycle. We wanted to see how their needs and practices aligned or not um, as these different people touch the data throughout the life cycle. So you can look at data, you can think about data reuse, curation, and sharing. And what we did is we conducted a case study. And this study was partially funded by the Encyclopedia of Life and NEH. And we examined 11 zoo archaeologists. So now we're just focusing on archaeology as a discipline, but we're looking at a subdiscipline, zoo archaeologists. So those who study animal bones. And two curators. And these 13 people, two curators, 11 zoo archaeologists, were engaged in collaborative data sharing, curation, and reuse. Um, and so essentially, we were following the flow of data among these three data activities as they unfolded. And we asked, how does what happens in one part of the life cycle create challenges or facilitate data work in another part of the life cycle? And so examining four life cycle stages for their influence on each other, we are able to see uh, data production, data sharing, data curation, and data reuse stages. And what we found was that all these stages influenced one another, with the ex exception of the curation stage, which only impacted reuse. The data production stage impacted other stages the most frequently, but they also had the most, most of the impacts within that stage on other stages were negative. Most curation impacts on reuse were positive. Uh, sharing impacted curation the most, followed by reuse. And then reuse impacted the other stages, and it impacted the other stages the least frequently, but all of those impacts were positive. And so what's so stark in this study is the overwhelmingly negative impact of data production processes on later stages of the life cycle. And this is expected to some degree um, because it's the argument for early engagement in the life cycle for some of you, depending on your RDM role. With, without it, you may be the ones left doing the additional work to ready the data for reuse because the alternative would be to allow the data to be depositive but not necessarily fully reusable. So engaging researchers after data management planning but before data deposit is critical. And I've seen that in my other work looking at librarians' perspectives on factors influencing research data man management programs. But there's this tendency to get a peak activity during data management planning, and then we kind of, you know, li the librarians that I spoke to go into this valley where not a lot happens, and then there's a peak activity during data deposit. So although there are some that see the importance of having more engagement between these two points, Right, there's also expression of concern about getting overwhelmed because it can be time consuming. So again, I'm wondering, given our, given our findings and your experience, how do you engage researchers during the data production process to get what you and reusers need without overwhelming your resources or those of the data producer? So seeing the results from that case study of collaborative data sharing, curation, and reuse, we wanted to examine what data producers were doing at the point of creation to consider how we could intervene at that point so that the data flows through the life cycle more smoothly and data sharing and curation and reuse are, more, are easier, more effective. And so given that the slow data project was born, and this is a project that's funded by NEH, 
and it's designed to examine these questions within, again, archaeology by conducting interviews and observations at four archaeological excavation sites. So the difference between the slow data project and the prior case study is that for the slow data project, we're examining data production practices in action, identifying how and why they may cause problems in later life cycle stages, and developing recommendations to address them. In the interest of time, I'll try to talk through uh, two finding, findings, which were common actually across these excavation sites. So the first finding relates to data recording and documentation inconsistencies, both of which neg negatively impacted curation and reuse in the case study that I talked about. But was, it was also something that we could see impacting curation and reuse for these particular excavation projects. So across the four excavation sites, we found that the instruction and guidelines developed for these projects did not sufficiently support the teams, given the documentation they were expected to produce, to produce in the end. So in several cases, the instructions and the guidelines either did not exist, were incomplete, or, in, or inconsistent. Some things were written down, others were verbally communicated from someone's memory. So for instance, the photo, there were guidelines for photo editing that were communicated verbally each time a new person rotated through to do the work. So there was more room for error and in interpretation or forgetfulness on the person sharing the information. For one of the projects, cataloging finds in the database was described as a trial and error process in absence of an updated manual to kind of take that cataloger who was, an, again, new to the project, take that person through the process of cataloging finds. There were also illustrators on this project. And they had a few guidelines for drawing style, but there were no real conventions for expressing the data in the drawing. And so when these things are important for archaeologists in terms of reuse, this idea of inconsistency becomes a problem. In other cases, team members did not refer to guidelines as often or as others. And when guidelines didn't exist, they tried to glean them from documentation written in previous years. Again, trying to glean that from from previous documentation with no idea about what's really important and, and what's going on um, creates inconsistencies within across people as well as across teams. Uh, we also saw inconsistencies in how the same information was captured across different documentation types. So handwritten labels versus forms versus field notebooks versus the database. In one project, the difficulties were due to differences between how the team was trained to write something down on a form with pen, on pen and paper versus what they, were required, what they were required to enter into the database. So in absence of these instructional resources that were not necessarily mutually enforcing, as I said, the projects ha ended up having varying levels of documentation quality across people and teams. To deal with these issues, we offered a series of recommendations depending on the project. Uh, that range from redesigning templates to creating and updating guidelines and manuals and database fields to developing or redesigning formal lectures around data management and documentation. In other words, very little to do with the technology and the data standards, more about developing consistent recording and management processes and procedures. Now, the second finding relates to the difficulties discovering and accessing the project's data. It was interesting because there were data that were entered into the database that were siloed because they were difficult to discover and access given database design. There were also data that were left out of the database that were siloed because the data were difficult to discover and access. So two different reasons for the same problem. Uh, two types of recommendations were offered. So in the case of the stuff in the database, it was more about the database being designed to store data but not necessarily discover and access that data. And we made recommendations that would broaden the team's perspective on the database and how it could be used. They were focused on putting stuff in the database and storage, not attuned to how data creation and management practices impacted later retrieval and analysis. So some of this gets to the more technical aspects of database design and database keys. 
But on some projects, it also spoke to how students in particular connect the database to their current versus their future work. Uh, their current work being storage versus discovery and access later, or data recording versus data reuse. And in this case, we suggested more opportunities for them to make use of the database records, seeing firsthand the importance of data consistency and linking and description and recording. So in the case of the things that were outside of the database, we had to address the freedom that the project director directors have given to team members who were analyzing some aspect of the data and providing their analysis and findings back to the project. So for instance, a, special, a person who specializes in coins would take those coins and create data and do their analysis and they'd bring that back to the project director. It wouldn't, but that data or that documentation wouldn't get uh, integrated into the database. So in a similar way that federal funding agencies in the U.S. were asking researchers to record, document, and manage data for others to use, we were asking the project directors, or we recommended that the project directors do the same within their teams. But this was more of a discussion and a negotiation about specifics in terms of data and documentation. So we recommended that they develop a written data policy that outlined the project's expectations for sharing data within and outside of the project, a timeline for getting that data, and plans for publications based on that data. We also recommended starting discussions with these specialists about how their data could be integrated with the data from the larger excavation project. So in light of these recommendations, but also this work more broadly that I tried to give a quick tour of today, it's clear that those engaged in the various life cycle stages, whether it's data production, sharing, curation, or reuse, are not always well aligned for various reasons, one of which is competing needs. So given your role, and I really see your role, a lot of the roles for the folks on the phone today, as a, one of the few intermediaries that can influence some, if not all, of these stages. And so that takes me to, to my third uh, question or wondering in terms of your work, and that's how you enable more effective flow of data throughout the life cycle when dealing with some of these competing needs, whether it's the data pro producers upstream or the reusers downstream. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca. Okay. So um, we're almost done with the presentation part as I try to forward this slide. There we go. Um, I want to um, mention that in a learning guide that we posted in the chat, um, and that's available on the interest group webpage, uh, we've included these five discussion questions. Uh, and these uh, come from both parts of our presentation today and uh, are really um, intended to have you think about your local conditions. Um, and we'll be using these as the basis for our discussion and the interest group discussions at the end of this month. Uh, so we, we encourage you to be thinking about what the most influential incentives are for you locally and this, how this may be shaping your own services, your own service bundle, um, and how specifically the development of your RDM service bundle um, may need to reflect some broader institutional strategy and what is that. Um, one of the challenges, and I think that this can be particularly true in the U.S., and this is number three, is um, for you to ask your questions of yourself about how do you manage um, guideline, you know, the, the tracking of guidelines and mandates, uh, and how this also informs the services that you offer. I, I mentioned that this can be particularly challenging in the U.S. because we do not have a single national mandate here. We have them coming from multiple national funders as well as private funders. Uh, and that can make it particularly challenging. And then following up from um, some of the questions about researchers is um, 
how do you know what your researchers need and how are you going about figuring that out? And then finally, to reiterate one of the questions that Michelle posed earlier was how do you engage researchers during data pr production to get what you and reusers need while balancing resources? So um, very quickly, here's our calendar. We're going to have uh, later this month of November interest group meetings um, with uh, myself, Ishelle, as well as with Brian. Uh, and then coming up in early December, we'll have uh, a webinar uh, about um, acquiring RDM services. Uh, and then we'll have a final interest group meeting related to that. So we'll be specifically talking about um, do you purchase, is, do you build or buy, um, how do you work with other institutions or services to scale, um, working with uh, um, minimal resources, etc. Uh, and then again, that webinar is coming up on December 4th. So if you haven't already registered, um, we can give you the link for that. And uh, I believe we have a little more than 10 minutes for discussion. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Brian. Um, I've been sort of watching the chat here. Um, so um, while people are thinking of questions, uh, we did have a couple that popped up in the chat during the uh, discussions. Um, one was from Debbie, and she was interested in um, you know what campus unit? Uh, this goes back to the to the discussion of Illinois um, that Rebecca presented, and she wanted to know where the FTEs for the uh, research data management services were located. And Rebecca answered that question uh, in the chat. But for those of you who didn't uh, notice it, um, uh, the research data service at Illinois is located in the library. Uh, although they get most of their funding uh, from the Office of, uh, of Research. Um, and then there was a question for Ishel from Rachel. Um, uh, this is interesting. Uh, she, she'd like to know, um, uh, to provide support at the data collection stage, uh, for example, at an archaeological dig, you know, to what extent do you have to be a subject specialist to provide that support? Um, and how far do generic good practice advice, uh, how far does that get you in terms of meaningful and useful support? I think that always, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't unmute, so hopefully I'll start again. So in terms of the generic good practice, I still think that that is still meaningful and useful. I think what was important in archaeology as well was just Again, getting to the point where we actually understood how the archaeologists were recording their data, what kind, whether, and that would maybe in, uh, examining documents, so examining the handwritten labels they were creating once they found an artifact versus the forms that they were filling out versus the database, and kind of looking across those things and seeing where some of the in inconsistencies come into play. And so for us, it was that it was really talking to them and, and seeing some of the things that they were putting it, using to record and, and doing an analysis of those things. Um, the question as to whether or not you need to be a subject specialist, um, I am not an archaeologist. I am, my PhD is in information systems. So, but you know, I, it's this matter of kind of looking across things and, again, talking with people to kind of understand where the hiccups are in the process, where they feel they are, versus what you're seeing or hearing when you're talking to them. So I think both generic would be good thing to start with, but also just talking to them and getting a better understanding and a sense of kind of what some of the issues are. So we did have on that flow data project, we do have archaeologists as well as me, who, who's a non-archaeologist. Um, and so I don't, I didn't necessarily need any kind of subject specialty to be able to kind of do some of that, those things. And I think just also kind of looking and reading uh, some of the work that is out there on the different disciplinary areas, whether it's things that were written in practice by folks that are currently doing this kind of work or you know, me who's a researcher, but working in conjunction with some of those folks. And I think that will help as well. 
Thanks, uh, Ishelle. Um, so we still have a few minutes uh, left. If there are any other questions, either for Rebecca or for Ishelle, you can put them in the in the chat, and we can um, uh, we can have um, Ishelle and, and Rebecca address them. This is Rebecca again. One thing that I didn't address in uh, the presentation, but that was related to Debbie's question, uh, is where are RDM services located? Uh, and one of the things that it located in within the campus organizational structure, shall we say. Uh, and at Illinois, they're located in the library. Um, what we did, and, and also in Monash, in in Australia, we found that they're located in the library. Uh, and I think it's very typical for libraries to be taking a lead in this. Uh, but what we did also find is that at Edinburgh and at Wackenhagen, there's sort of a campus level unit that sort of cuts across many um, different sort of functional units that provides support for research data management. Uh, and so, um, and, and, and services are often marketed then at the institutional level rather than the library level. Brian, I see that there's um, an additional question here from Kathy Pink, if you want to take that one on. Um, I'm afraid that's not showing up in my chat. Was it sent? Oh, I yeah. am sorry. That is um, <laughs> only to the host and presenter. So I will go ahead um, and read this. Uh, and this is uh, the downfall. So for those of you who are um, thinking about or have already posed a question to attendees only, um, unfortunately, those don't. Uh, the panelists don't get an opportunity to see those. So uh, please um, uh, present. Uh, uh, use the all participants option. That can be confusing. I don't know why WebEx um, has that as an option. Uh, so for Ashell, I agree with your comments on support for data collection having the potential to overwhelm librarian resources. To what extent do you feel this support is the responsibility of data librarians? Or should it be handled o handed over to other institutional experts? For example, IT support, or IT services, research ethics, legal advisors, contract teams, departmental IT supporters, equipment facilities, et cetera. And I'll go ahead and copy and paste this into um, chat so that everybody can see the whole thing. OK, um, hopefully I'm off of mute because I didn't do that yes, last time. Uh, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so that's a great question, Kathy, and I am I I'm gonna it, it I think it depends on the need. So I think when it comes down to um, organizing their data, managing it, uh, recording it, uh, and getting it uh, during that research process, uh, knowing that it's gonna come down the pike to curation. I think that's a wonderful opportunity for those that are involved in that area, whether they're librarians, archivists, data management, or curators, to kind of get a jump on what what they know they need and what they know their reusers need to ensure that they're getting what what what's important. Uh, but I can definitely see researchers consulting, you know, IT if it's you know large big data and they need to you know, figure out how to deal with that. I can see going to IT for that. Or I can see going to an ethics committee if it's about, you know, uh, sens sensitive information, whether in, in uh, archaeology and zoology, a lot of the times that comes down to location of spe specimens or species as well as where um, excavation sites are. So I can see having that kind of discussion with with an ethics team or a legal team. So I think it it really just comes down to their need, um, and again, getting in on that front end in the roles that you have is that is a great opportunity to kind of sit down with them, talk with them, understand the broader picture, 
and and farm stuff out. What can you what can you do given your expertise versus who else do you either need to be a point person to or a, a handoff to to be able to um, get the answers to the questions that they need on these other areas. So I, again, I think it's this combination of bringing these people together that have this variety of areas of expertise and perspectives to, to kind of get it done. I think that's a, that's a constant theme in my work, but I, but I think in my, in, my, in my research, but I also think it's a theme in practice. And I'd be curious on the other side of just the discussion of all of this when we have that coming up, kind of how how any of you have dealt with that as either the point person or the person that kind of um, hands hands their needs off to others, because I can see that as a as a uh, a good point as well for you, getting what you need, but also handing off to others to get answers that you may not necessarily um, have. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions for the moment. Um, we have a few more minutes, so you can go ahead and if you have any questions, um, type them in to all uh, participants. Um, I know we have some upcoming uh, uh, discussion sessions coming up with the interest group, so that can also be an opportunity to dig into these topics um, in a little more detail. Um, I'm going to take a moment here while there's a pause and just remind folks that uh, we've been recording this webinar and we will have this webinar as well as the slides available to share uh, afterwards just as soon as our communications team can get that posted to the website. Not seeing anything else here. Um, uh, Rebecca and Brian, Michelle, do you want to say any uh, more words to, to close us out here? I just like to say thanks for your time. Hopefully, um, what I what I pre presented was helpful, and I'm looking forward to the discussions and hearing more about your experiences. Same here. Thanks everybody for attending, uh, and we'll look forward to following up on the discussion later this month. Okay. With that. Uh, thanks for all of your time, and this concludes today's webinar.